What's going on, guys? It's Kyle Carroll from MyMMANews.com and Carroll's Corner MMA Podcast. Tonight, we got Cage Wars heavyweight fighting on September 11th, Al Morrow. Al, how you doing? Not bad. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. You know, awesome. can't wait for these fights to start. Oh, you know, yeah. Tim Rankins is putting together a fantastic fight card, and you're on it. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. So, uh... You know, basically, I'm back with Mohawk Valley Mixed Martial Arts out of New Hartford, New York, uh, with Duff Holmes, the head coach. And uh, I'm really excited for this one. And I was asking him, what do you think we should go back to 205? And, you know, I'm heavier than I've been. And he says, you know what? I think you're actually a lot bigger than you give yourself credit for. You're not a small guy. Uh, We should go heavyweight. So we had a few guys fall out. Uh, You know, I won't name names, obviously, because for one, it's amateurs. I'm not going to give anyone any flack Mm -hmm. for it. You know, we all have lives after this. So, uh, but, you know, a few guys said no, a few guys uh, said yes and then backed out. And then uh, next thing I know is they said Carlos Pereira. And I said, oh, wow. You know, I I hadn't seen him fight since, I want to say, Wolf Oak, or he had one more fight after that against someone else. Uh, but I'm actually the one that got Carlos into cage wars. So, oh, okay. so, so it's getting pretty cool. I, uh, I saw him fight at a promotion that will remain nameless, <laughs> but that we all know who I'm talking about. And then, um, I said, you know, you ought to really go fight uh, for cage wars because, you know, I think cage wars is the best amateur talent, especially, you know, if you're talking about New York city up, I, I think, or, or above New York city, New York city has a couple nice ones too, but I think cage wars is a fantastic job. But. Absolutely, and everything's coming full circle. And now you're fighting them. Yeah. Um, so you moved to MV with MV MMA. How's that? How's that transition going? Awesome. So I, you know, I've been with Duff since I was 14. I started training with him when I was 14. I was in college, and basically, I took a fight without uh, running it by him, and we had a falling out over it. And he said, you know, I don't want you representing my gym if I if I'm not even training you. And I basically said, well, you know, that's fine. At the time, I was okay with that because I was in college and I wasn't sure if after college I was going to be able to do this again. You know, and this is my first fight after college, just about, you know, my last fight, I was still in an internship, Uh, you know, and all I did for the last two years really was just kind of maintain, you know, training and learning myself. Then, you know, COVID hit, one of my gyms closed and, uh, you know, I wasn't really training there a whole awful lot to begin with. I was more coaching at that point. And then I, uh, ran across an old video uh, with, with Duff and I way back when I was like 15, 16, I I sent, Hey, can I come talk to you with the video? And, you know, we made up just about then we both kind of, you know, admitted that what I did for one was stupid and maybe how we both reacted to each other was a little meatheaded, you know, we're, we're both athletes. So obviously we're going to, you know, testosterone flares, that's it. (laughs) But, But, you know, but I'm so happy because it's like, it's like I never left because even at the events, though I wasn't part of MVMMA, I always talked to the guys. I always went in the back of the locker room and bullshitted with them. You know, it was, it was cool. Uh, So it's, it's great to have like an actual team here right now. You know, I, I didn't have that for the last few years. I was in a college wrestling room and sure I was in decent shape, but I wasn't getting ready for fights really at that point. If, if you catch what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a different type of shape from wrestling and MMA. Absolutely. Although, um, you, amateur is only three minutes, but there's a distinct difference for those who are uh, not familiar with it. Oh, yeah. um, but you know, half your team is fighting. You got Kyle <laughs> Kaler's defending his title. Yep. You got um, uh, Kennedy fighting. You, you got a lot of guys on the, from the squad from the yeah. MBMMA MMA representing. So Kyle's defending his belt, and so is Brendan. Uh, you know, they both got pretty tough guys. I'm excited. Uh, you know, I knew Harley Locklear was going to uh, be a tough challenge for anybody when I saw his first fight, you know, and I kept hearing his name too. And, you know, even, even on the amateur circuit in our, in our local mm-hmm. area, if you hear someone's name, you still want to keep your eye out for them, you know, because, uh, like, like I said, you know, around here we have some of the amateurs are tough SOBs, you know? So I start hearing Harley's name. I I've known Kyle since he started fighting. Cause I think we made uh, our debut on the same night. And uh, what was it? Uh, then we got Vinny Alderuccio, who is a nice Irish lad, if you couldn't tell by the last name. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, he's actually an old teammate of mine at my boxing gym. So I'm really excited for him to make his debut. He trained out at Rufus Sport for a little bit, uh, which was cool. Uh, and then, awesome. yeah, then we got Ja, who I'm – it's no knock against anyone else, but I'm most excited for Ja fighting because he uh, he started just maybe, uh, you know, I think in late March. 
and we're already throwing him in there because he's understanding things so fast. Uh, Chris Kyles, I am almost convinced at this point he's going to knock his dude dead. Uh, <laughs> and just because, dude, he's a 135er, but he, man, I, I can take a good shot, but Chris hits me. He's like, holy shit. You know, it's, it's different. Uh, and then, sorry for running through everybody. Let's see, Anthony, uh, I'm really excited for him because he's been training as long as I have. I just think, you know, stars finally aligned. He's able to actually get a fight now. You know, he's all and all, but he's got a ton of experience in the gym. And I'm excited because um, I do think he's going to be one of those guys that really, you know, comes to when it comes to uh, the fight. Uh, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, uh, Dom is coming back. I think Dom is, is really going to show that, you know, he, he's not just a brawler, not going to go out and just try and scrap with it. Uh, <laughs> although he can. God knows he can. But, yeah, you know, I'm excited for everybody. Um you know, it's a really tough squad, and we have a lot of guys that couldn't make it to this card that are still, you know, training with us as if they were fighting. And we got a lot of guys ready. MVMA is a uh, very – Duff always says every day we run very deep. <laughs> so. Yeah, you guys definitely do have a deep squad, and every show at Cage Wars MV, MV MMA is very well represented. Um, but Duff does, I think, a great job of keeping you guys – um, like close and like almost like a family. Every yeah. time I'm at, I'm at the events, I see you guys running all together. Yeah. Um, everyone's real close and friendly and whatnot. And he he hangs around, hangs out with everyone. And yeah. He definitely seems like he makes it like a family affair. Yeah, uh, that's the cool thing about MVMMA compared to like, and it's no knock on like jujitsu schools or anything uh, at all. You know, I forgot exactly what it was because, you know, when I was a kid, I used to hear Duff say, well, we don't do jujitsu or kickboxing class. I was like, well, I don't know why that makes any sense. I see world champions do it. But at the same time, I also see most world champions train with MMA gloves on when they do jujitsu. I don't see them in the gi, you know, and a bunch mm -hmm. of other things. And, and he said, I coach mixed martial arts. And yeah, Duff knows tradition. He knows the gi. I, I don't really know what belt he is. He never really talks about it. We never do. Uh, but, you know, but he just uh, – we always talk about, you know, strict mixed martial arts training. And it feels – the closest thing I can tell you is it feels like a wrestling squad. We all rely on each other uh, to keep us up at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, at the end of the day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and to account for each other. But at the end of the day, it is us doing it. And he makes it well known, you know, that at the end of the day, we bleed the sport. We bleed the gym. We bleed teammates, you know, and that's just it. And it – Really, I guess compared to I'm sorry for the long winded answer, but I guess no, not at all. Compared to like some jujitsu schools that I've been to, where these guys have never been athletes once in their life, and some of the coaches were never athletes or played in a competitive sport or anything, and just you know now they're good and they don't have that sportsmanship aspect to it, which I've seen, and there's no knock on them. There's a lot of people that every jujitsu school I've played at or I've trained at, it's you know, nicest people on the planet. I have met some, some jackasses and some, you know, mean spirited individuals. And uh, whereas here Duff tells you immediately, Hey, this is the sport. We still show sportsmanship, although we're going in to try and kill each other. It's like, this is how a sportsman acts. And that's why I like MVMMA so much. You know, we never have any beef within the gym. There's no trash talking anybody. And if that happens, we just kind of don't tolerate it at the end of the day, you know, there's no, there's no chirping, and I like absolutely. That. I no, like that's that. awesome. I think yeah, it kind of avoids, I'm sure, any problems between anyone inside the gym oh, yeah. because, because I'm sure there's plenty of guys within the same weight class. Um, but speaking of weight class, you're talking about going heavyweight. How much are you gonna weigh weigh in at uh, weigh-ins? Ah, uh, right now I know Duff wants me to weigh 250 tomorrow because everyone's cutting weight and he didn't want to keep me out. <laughs> uh, but I'm about 255 right now. I'm probably going to skip rope in the morning and get down to 250. I wanted to be like 240, but Duff keeps saying, he's like, hey, you know, let's just get you in monstrous shape and, and keep a couple pounds on you. And I said, okay, cool. Why not? You know, I don't feel slow. That's the thing is I feel faster than I did at 205. Uh, okay. It's because I'm training properly again. You know, I feel faster, stronger, you know, everything. And uh, I never really sucked myself out for 205. You know, wrestling, I walked around at 220. Uh, because we were working so hard. Uh, my thing is, is I'm just uh, I'm doing everything as Duff says, and it's working. Uh, you know that, and my boxing coach too. I still see my boxing coach at least you know two, three times a week. Hit the mitts with them and do drills and stuff. Uh, but you know the heavyweight aspect, uh, 
it'll be nice not to cut. You know, I'm not eating or drinking whatever I want. I'm still very healthy with it, but it's just uh, Duff said, you didn't know how to fight as a heavyweight. Let me show you. I said, okay, mm -hmm. cool. And in boxing I did uh, because it's very simple, you know, where, because, you know, it's one aspect you're punching and then there's a lot of other things. Heavyweights did not have the speed or endurance that I had when I boxed in the amateurs. However, in MMA, you know, when I fought Tim Cronk, uh, you know, I still felt that I could have continued, but that's neither here nor there. And, uh, you know, but that, that was kind of early in your career too. Yeah. It was my second fight. Yeah. You know, but I, uh, you know, I had my hands down. I wasn't, I was just kind of having fun. I was in the middle of my wrestling season. I went to go wrestle the next day. I wrestled a, a four, four match tournament the next oh, day. So, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, was young and dumb, just kind of doing whatever. Uh, you know, then I fought Mark Worthington and we were both virtually the same size. We both weighed in at like 230 and I was kind of summing out at that point, starting to drop in weight. Uh, and then I just figured, you know, oh, I'm probably too small for, for heavyweight and for 205. You know, when I fought Corey, Corey's a big guy, you know, uh, was really the first person to out muscle me, which was different for me. That mm -hmm. never usually happens. Um, and Corey said, you ought to go down to 185. And then we did like this body, Duff did this body mass test with me. It's just like, we'd have to cut off a leg <laughs> <laughs> if we were ever to get you down there with any type of healthy uh, manner. So he said, uh, you know, right now, Al, let's just actually teach you and use all your skill set. And I think you're going to find that heavyweight's going to be a pretty good home. I don't know if I'm going to stay there forever. Obviously, you know, I'm mm -hmm. still, you know, I'm only six foot, if that, maybe 5'11", six foot you know, kind of short, stocky guy. I've been called the white DC at my gym once or twice now because I'm, start, I'm starting to wrestle a little bit. I hope I hope no one heard that, but I am starting to wrestle a little bit, finally. So so we'll see. Awesome, but. awesome, man. So uh, what was COVID like for you? Because I haven't really spoke to you uh, since right. COVID took place. Um, what did you learn about yourself as a fighter? And now this is your first fight coming back since COVID. T tell us what you learned from the, uh, the whole pandemic. So my thing was uh, over the pandemic was since my gym wasn't open and I had to learn myself, I, I lived in the building where my boxing gym was. So I did a lot with boxing and got back to loving that and coaching. You know, we were we got in touch with the county and we still had a few of our kids that were in close proximity to us. And I still coached. And honestly, I wasn't sure if I was going to compete again. Uh, I was more into the coaching aspect of things. And so I started getting all these instructional things from like BJJ fanatics and fanatic wrestling and dy dynamic striking, looking over those and just realizing that I'm a very visual learner with things. And I started training that by myself. I had one or two friends come in and kind of over that span of time just said, you know, I got the physical aspects and I got the mind to do it, but I just need to expand a bit more. Uh, you know, there are some things that I wasn't looking into or thinking of, and I started looking into and thinking of things and I started getting better at it because of it. And so, you know, that, and I was helping Corey train, uh, for a few of his fights, uh, for, uh, before the pandemic, you know, him and James Carroll fought and him and Hamdi Abdel Wahab. I went out and, uh, you know, I love working with Corey. He's one of my best friends on this planet. I call him my older brother now. And, uh, <laughs> You know, so I worked with him and I was working with a lot of different people uh, before I went back to Duff and just kind of realized, OK, I know what I got to do. Uh, so my big thing over the pandemic was I was OK if I never competed again at that point, because that's what I thought was going to happen after college. I figured that was going to be it. You know, like you got to get a job, got to, you know, live the normal life now. But I, I realized balancing not just MMA wise, but life wise, I realized how to balance myself and other things around me. So that was a good plus for me. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Cause you know, a lot of people think it's, uh, you know, you just go to work, you go to training. There's, yeah. there's a lot that goes into it. You're training five to six days a week absolutely. plus working, putting in eight hour shifts. That's a lot to balance. Absolutely. You know, and then, uh, you know, then I still coach on top of it too. Yeah. You know, but the thing is, is I, uh, you know, everyone says, how do you have any time for yourself? The time at the gym is time to myself a lot, you know, cause I, I realized, uh, especially too, you know, though, even if I never make the walk to the pro cage or ring or whatever it might be and make it a living per se, uh, the sport's my life at that point. You know, I've been doing boxing since I was 12, started MMA when I was 14, started wrestling when I was 14. You know, I started all these things at such a young age that, 
you know, it kind of becomes, you know, if someone talks to me about something, it usually revolves around a few things, music, my job, uh, World of Warcraft, and the, <laughs> yeah, and I swear <laughs> to God, World of Warcraft, and then this, you know, and I'm very much a creature of habit. I don't like doing uh, things that are so far out of my window. I'm very basic when it comes to that. So, uh, you know, my day usually is I go to work eight to four, come home, I uh, get home by 430. And then uh, by that point, maybe I have something to eat and then I'm out the door at five, then 530 through 930. I'm at the gym. You know, I'm coaching uh, one on one in kids class. And then I'm uh, and then I'm training, you know, fight team training from seven to nine. So and everyone says, how do you have time to do anything? You make it. You know, if you want something, mm -hmm. if you want it to if you want it to work. And I realized that when I went to school for music, if you want to get better at something, you know, you don't you don't get to Carnegie Hall without practice, you know. So you have to keep doing it. You might lose a few hours of sleep. You might be a little sore the next day. You might be tired. But at the end of the day, I'm happier because of it, you know. Absolutely. There's a lot of sacrifice in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that you're not going out every night and um, you're missing things. Yeah. A, a lot of sacrifice. But when you're coaching kids, how much detail do you kind of – like you, you're teaching it. So now you're like, all right, now I got to apply this to when I'm like, you're thinking about it, right? Yeah. After you're teaching and coaching it, like, all right, now I got to really apply this. How, how has that, how much has that helped you? Uh, with boxing, I noticed it helped a lot. And now that I coach the one one class for, uh, for my MMA gym with, uh, you know, the MMA, I even remember, I, I forget a few things every now and again, like tiny little details that, you know, you do in such a rush because you've been doing it for so mm -hmm. long. And then, and then you just keep remembering, uh, you know, music school, my uh, professor said a professional will do something until he can no longer do it wrong again. An amateur will do it until he gets it right the first time, you know? And so I started doing that or Bruce Lee's famous thing. You know, I, I fear not the man who trained a thousand kicks once one kick a thousand times. So, mm -hmm. Details as far as drilling really got back to me. So, so going back to just basics, you know, if something looks sloppy to me, it wasn't, let's just do it a couple of times, get it right. It's I drill it until I'll never mess it up again. You know, my, I noticed my snatch single leg, uh, like in college was, was good. And then I hadn't done it for about a year or two because of COVID and everything else. And then I noticed, Oh, I'm reaching too much. I'm doing this too much. How do I fix that? You know? So now that I'm mm -hmm. coaching, you're right. There is a level of detail you do look into sometimes. However, it is important not to try and coach yourself. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense, you know, don't, you know, let, let your coach do it. He, can see it outside in a lot easier than you can, just like I can with the kids that I coach or, or the beginners that I coach. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, let your coaches coach you, but yeah. at the same time, you still got the, the motions and the steps going through your head. Um, yeah. Al, what, what motivates you? Like you seem like a guy who is always on the go. you got the YouTube channel going, <laughs> uh, which is, it's been amazing how quickly you built that. And yeah. You got a lot going on, but like, what's the thing that drives you and that your goals and your, like that motivation behind you? If I stopped, I'd probably start derailing pretty quickly. You know, I uh, I've talked about mental health in the past with me. Uh, you know, I've been diagnosed bipolar recently, so I was misdiagnosed for the last few years. So that's great, but you know, uh, but basically, uh, for me, what motivated me was, uh, you know, when I started the whole thing is because I was picked out and bullied. And then once you get past that stage in life, uh, you know, and obviously when you're a kid, I'm going to be world heavyweight champion. I'm going to be better than Ali Tyson, Holyfield, all these guys that you looked up to. And, you know, um, my, my dream was to beat Rocky Marciano's record when I was a kid, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but you know what? I only have four, I have four losses in the amateurs. And if I win four more times and I have his amateur record, so maybe that's something that's, that's Oh, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, but, hey, who knows? He was eight and four. People don't know that, but, uh, but what was it well, for me? What actually gets me going and motivated is um, I don't like to just limit myself. You know, I, I, I always try and be the best at whatever I do. Uh, if not trying to compete at that level. Although I remember when I got into college wrestling, I did not belong at that mat with a lot of those guys. You had a lot of guys that had won counties down in Long Island that had gone to states, that had won states, that were doing a lot of things, you know, a lot of really good talent. And I got my ass handed to me. But you know what? At the end of the day, I said, by the end of the year, I will improve so much I will be able to hang with these guys or I, I will be able to go wrestle a former state champion from high school and compete with them. 
And uh, I was able to do that. You know, I, I, there was a, you know, once again, sorry for the long winded answer, but you know, you go, you go back to um, after my first year of college, I think my record was like four wins and 16 losses, but I went to uh, a little open mat thing in my local area. And there was this kid that took like third in States and I was able to, I didn't win, you know, the hypothetical, Mm -hmm. I kept up with him. I didn't get pinned, you know, and everything. And so that was my goal. So whenever I lose, especially, you know, when I lost to Corey, I took a lot from that. When I lost to Yuri, I took a lot from that. When I didn't get the decision, you see, I changed it up there. I didn't get the decision against uh, Billy Brennan, you know, or or I lost to uh, the ref stopped it against Tim Cronk, you know, and a lot of those things. Um, What motivates me is I do not like being last in line. You know, I want to prove that, you know what, on my best day, one day I will be able to beat you. And that's really what gets me going. I, I can be a, I'm not a sore loser, but I can be bitter to myself. So that keeps me going. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's that pride. It's like who, who likes losing? I don't know anyone yeah. who likes losing. It, so. You know, you summed up exactly what I could have said. I could have shortened that whole thing. Pride keeps me going. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't show it too much, but you know, it, uh, I can be, I can be, I can be, uh, you know, sometimes you have to swallow your pride, and but sometimes I don't want to. <laughs> hey, fair enough. Yeah. Al, I absolutely love the uh, long-winded answers. Not <laughs> not enough fighters give those. Sometimes right. they're one-worded answers, and that makes it difficult for uh, for an interview. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so t- but, tell me a little bit about the podcast, the uh, the YouTube channel, a little bit, and how who, like you was that something you just like you know let me start this or someone people asking for it and uh, asking for your knowledge and. And then you ran with it. You've done a pretty good job with it. So I started right after the Cora Norman fight because I, uh, that's when my, my ex, you know, my girlfriend at the time uh, told me you ought to go get looked into for uh, some mental health things. And I did. And uh, my, my uh, I'm trying to think of the word. My counselor at the time of college was telling me, you know, uh, you have to find something that keeps your mind occupied. What's something that you want to do? Uh, so that's where the YouTube channel came from because I kind of sat there and said, you know, I want to do this whole thing. And, but if I wanted to do it, I wanted to do it right. So I started thinking the idea about a week after the Norman fight, but I wanted a logo. I wanted good equipment. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to start it out like crap. I wanted to start off good right off the bat. My thing was that there are a lot of channels out there like fit the box, uh, C squared, that boxing guy, uh, you know, rate this gear and a couple other guys that review, uh, Jordan Miller on YouTube, uh, is another guy that review all this equipment. And I'm sure that they train and I never once denied that, but I don't know if they competed like I did. You know, I, I have over 50, 60 amateur boxing matches at the end of the day. I have, I don't know how many wrestling matches. Then I train every day for, you know, uh, mixed martial arts and stuff. It's not like I just go hit the bag once a day. Mm-hmm. You know, it's I'm putting these things through a field test and quite the field test at that. Uh, so I said, you know, because I had gotten some of the equipment for off their recommendation or looked at it. I'm like, this isn't as good as they thought. They cracked out pretty quick because I'm using it pretty fast you know mm-hmm. uh so my thing was to give honest feedback on reviews for a guy that's actually competed that's why my videos are so long so people complain why are all your gear reviews a half hour you better know what you're buying because it could mean for a fighter it could mean your health as far as injuries go it could mean uh you know spending money on how much you're going to spend how long is it going to last is it approved at your gym is it that you know uh, is it recognized like a lot of people don't know this but if you brought a pair of clatoreus boxing gloves into a boxing gym and said i want to spar in these most gyms will tell you no really it's a puncher's glove it's okay. it's, it's a very it's a very flat surface your knuckles will pierce right through that thing all right they're uh, they're a puncher's glove for a reason you know training goes anyway it's a latex rubber so when you punch it basically folds around your knuckles like this. Your knuckles go right through and it bounces off because it's coming from a rubber tree. Whereas, uh, you know, obviously with a fight glove, it's horsehair, which if you spar in horsehair, there's something wrong with you. Um, and I won't go down that rabbit hole. But, you know, whereas if you see a lot of guys like in MMA, even look at uh, Kamaru Usman, Dwayne Ludwig, uh, Dwayne Ludwig's guys, rather, or a bunch of other guys use uh, companies called Winning. 
or, or Everlast Power Lock in their very soft and padded gloves because it's protecting my hands for the fight camp. It's also protecting my sparring partners. I don't want to cut my sparring partners up, so I want a smoother leather, you know, and stuff like that. It all goes into the equipment. So if you get an amateur to understand that now and they can actually, you know, adhere to that, then they'd be shocked by the time they turn pro and they go to other gyms and then they don't have the worst gear on the mat. You know, that's how it works basically. So that's why I started it because I felt a lot of these guys were doing it more from a hobby standpoint. I was doing it from, I'm actually busting my ass with this stuff. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important. Like people complaining that uh, reviews a half hour, the nuts. Cause anytime you're looking for a quality review, it's going to be a lengthy one. They're going to yeah. get into detail. I know when I was look, purchasing trucks, um, I went through a lot of videos looking at all different things, trying yeah. to, and, and you want to see like, Oh, how does this compare to that? this one and there's a lot of things you want to look into so i think the detail is uh very important and i think that's awesome that you put that much time into the videos yeah it, anyone who knows if you're filming you know a 30 minute video that Doesn't you put up that and, yeah it might <laughs> not seem that long and you're probably filming almost at least an hour or two yeah it. yeah you know and the other thing is is more than likely i answer the question that you have about the equipment mm -hmm. because i was that guy once i went on every video if there is like a three minute video like most of the most of the reviews that i saw and i noticed that a lot of the guys that were even around longer than me uh started you know they started doing close-ups of their gear out of nowhere and you know they start going into a bit more detail about certain things that weren't talked about before and i'm not saying that i started that but mm -hmm. You know, um, I take some credit for it, but I, uh, <laughs> but my, my thing is, uh, you know, <clears throat> I would click on a gear review would be three minutes. Oh, well they use cowhide leather. They, uh, use high density padding. It comes in lace ups in these sizes by it. Like what? <laughs> that doesn't answer anything that I had in mind, you know? Okay. What's the interior lining like, you know, is what about uh, my hands are too small or my hands are small. My hands are messed up because I broke I broke my hands when I was younger, you know, that and from years of punching, you know, even at 24, I just turned 24. My hands aren't necessarily in the best of shape. <laughs> you know, when you start punching stuff when you're 12, it's going to happen. Uh, so. I have to constantly ask these questions, you know, what, what's the padding like? Is it good for people that have brittle hands? What about people that don't have brittle hands? You know, stuff like that. So that's why I did it because I, I have had maybe one or two people say that my reviews or recommendations have not helped them. And usually the second recommendation always gets spot on. So I'm very proud of that. Awesome. For those who don't know, what's the name of your uh, YouTube channel and how can they find it? The Combat Corporation, your source of combat sports. Uh, basically, it's uh, you go on YouTube and you type in T-H-E-E, -E, the, and then Combat Corporation or type in Combat Corp. It's likely to come up. Even if you type my name, Al or Alex Morrow, it'll come up too. Uh, you know, I, I tag myself and all the things uh, too. You know, that's a big thing on YouTube. I found out is you have to tag things properly, turns out. So, <laughs> but... YouTube is yeah, very, uh, it, it's very complicated. Yes, it's, it's a lot more. To, when I got into it, like man, I said, there's a lot into this thing. But uh, but yeah, and uh, you know, if you find me on Instagram, combat underscore corp, or if you, uh, I don't use Twitter. I just I tried. I can't. Or if you go to the Facebook page, or even message me personally on Facebook, I, I do something called glove counseling. Is what my subscribers like to call it. Uh, so if you have a glove or something that you're looking into, odds are, I don't know if you can see all these things. I probably have it about, I got about 120, 130 pairs ready to go. So uh, I probably do have it. If I don't, you have something that's on my radar that I still know something about. So that's awesome. Yeah. That, that really is awesome. Uh, Al, let's get back to the fight. Uh, right. tell, tell us uh, what, what's the biggest challenges you think Carlos presents to you in this fight? I think he has dynamite sticks in both hands. Uh, you know, he put Jeremy on his ass pretty bad. Uh, you know, and uh, Jeremy got up and got the beautiful blast double. But I think Carlos is tall. I think he knows how to use his range. Uh, I think he is a very strong puncher. I also think, uh, you know, if you, you I, I followed his Instagram and stuff uh, before the fight, you know, more of a friendly basis. And I saw he was doing a lot more grappling. He got his blue belt and stuff. And, you know, that was something that he talked about after the Wolf Hole fight. Uh, when I went to the bar after I didn't drink, but I, I just went to go say hey to everybody. And he was just bummed. He's like, I need to work on my grappling, man. My wrestling sucks. I said, do it. So I'm sure in the three years since that fight, he's done that. 
Uh, so, mm-hmm. you know, I, in a lot of ways, I don't know what Carlos is going to bring. I know that he has a really stiff jab. He has really stiff punches. Uh, you know, I don't mean that he's stiff as a person. He's very loose. I just mean that his shots are, are they're very well placed and nothing is wasted. Um, I think he's got a bit more experience under his belt, especially when you fight someone like Jeremy, uh, you know, uh, I, I, t- I tell everyone this when they say, uh, how do you think the fight's going to go? I'm probably going to get washed. It's going to be bad. I'm going to get my ass kicked, you know, all these things. So, uh, <laughs> But I'm expecting um, – I'm also expecting the first real, real competent striker. You know, most people saw me and, you know, even uh, Yuri Panferov when I fight, fought him, New England Golden Gloves champion. Uh, you know, I – I don't know because I've worked with him several times. He's got heavy hands himself, you know. Uh, but after that fight, I've sparred with him and stuff. But I feel like when I when I touched him, he didn't like it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and Corey Norman's admitted, uh, and I've admitted to him, is that when we touch each other, we don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I I know personally for me, and it's, that's the one thing I can always tell people I'm proud of is that I do have a pretty hard shot, and I know where to place that shot, and so. You know, we'll see what Carlos does with that. Um, but this is the first time I can't just go out and try and wing your right hand and get it. You know, with some of the guys that were inexperienced on the feet, it was that easy for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you had Corey, who was smart, took me down. You had Yuri, who was smart, took me down. But the other guys beforehand were not so smart. <laughs> so, <laughs> Absolutely. But. So where do you think you have the advantage? I know you don't want to give too much out about how where you think you would uh, elevate over him. But... <sighs> um. If I had to give an answer, I'd say, you know, I can give the the classic thing of experience. I've been in there a lot, but, you know, it's also with experience. It's It also depends on the athlete and the person. I don't know if I really have that many advantages. I don't know how strong he is. I don't know, I don't know the guy, really. Uh, you know, I don't know how strong he is. He might have improved his striking some. You know, I always like to say that my that my boxing, uh, you know, I have a bit of advantage on a lot of people. Um, but I don't know uh, where my advantage would be. To be honest, you know, I'd say wrestling, but I've never really wrestled when I fought before. I think I did mm-hmm. one. I tried one takedown against Mark Worthington. It was a cool Puerto Rican head tie lock, and I was against the fence, and it got screwed. Otherwise, it would have been a cool takedown. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I've never really tried anything. So I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't have a really good answer. No, no, it's fine. I no, I'm no just, just curious. No, it was a great answer. I have no um, idea. Now, leading up to the fights, you know, right before, tell us kind of uh, like, you know, weigh-ins and right after weigh-ins and then leading up to your fight up until you get in the cage. Where's your mind at? How do you relax? Is your mind racing? No, uh, not so much anymore. My mind races the day of when I'm in the locker room. Because at that point, there is no getting out. Because you start thinking those thoughts like, why am I doing this? There's no getting out of this. I can't just walk now. You know, all these things. Uh, and obviously, that's subsided, um, you know, from performing over the mm-hmm. years between, you know, music, playing in front of people or fighting, you know, amateur boxing, wrestling, all these things in front of so many people. Uh I don't really get so much nervous about it because if I was so nervous and worrying about every other outcome but what the guy could do to me, uh, then I'd be in trouble. I, I can't think of a thousand other things. So for me, what keeps me calm, like about the fight, I honestly, I don't really think about Carlos too much. That helps, you know, obviously Duff and I have watched like the one or two fights that we see and, uh, you know, once or twice and, you know, just sit out, oh, you know, you study and respect the guy. Um, but as far what was your question again? I feel like I got off. I was just uh, no, you're fine. <laughs> I, no, I was, it was just kind of like how you ha- like how is your mind racing leading up to the fight? No. And then I'm also curious to when you step in the cage, when you first started from the first fight to now, um, was it one of those things where it's like everything was like black, like you black out and it just happened, and then now everything slows down, or is it kind of always been slow for you and you're able to like control it? When so. You get in there? When I first started my first amateur boxing match, I was uh, I was 13. So I trained for about a little over half a year before I got in there. I was so nervous. For my first 10, 15 bouts, I was nervous. My first bout in wrestling or performing uh, with music when I went to music school. But once you start doing it so long, you stop being so nervous. There's nothing that – like. We have a saying in, in music, and that is these people are never going to know that you made a damn mistake <laughs> because they <laughs> – because, at the end of the day, you'd like to walk up to after and say, what in the F do you know? <laughs> right. Uh, so, but what, what I say is when I compete 
for me now, and it's been like this, I'd say since I was maybe 16, 17, when I really started to hone in is I hear a few things. I don't really hear people saying anything. I think my last fight uh, with Corey, I remember you and, and uh, Will, I heard you get when I shoved Corey, uh, I heard you say, oh, Alex is pissed. And I heard that. And I was, I was pissed. <laughs> but, but that was because I'm trying to kill you and you're giving me a hug saying, good job, Corey. But, uh, <laughs> but basically, uh, I zone myself out. I hear my opponent's breathing. So I can get that pattern down and see when I can actually hit you to knock the win out of you. There's that. I, I hear your footsteps and I hear your coach and I hear my coach. I don't hear anything else. Or I'll hear some familiar voices because every now and again, you know, if I know there's some guy that's actually experienced that may not see something from my coach's perspective at that point, And he says, you got to stay on him. Like I remember when I fought uh, Mark Worthington and my coach is yelling, you got to stay on him. But I couldn't hear him. But I heard Davey Doolin in the back screaming, stay on him, Al, stay on him, because he was so close to the cage. And he, and he was screaming loud enough for me to hear him. So I said, okay. And then I heard that, start hearing my coach saying the same thing. He's like, okay, I got to get on him. And that's why I was on him like that. You know, everyone's like, oh, man, you, you even said, you said, oh, he's pouncing. I said, because, <laughs> because, he was, because obviously people are telling me he's hurt. He's probably hurt. Mm -hmm. And I kind of saw his legs go. But, you know, as far as the fight goes, it's not so much nerves. Uh, I will say, though, sometimes when it's over, there's a bit of a relief. Uh, one thing that's different to me is I don't like the anticipation of a decision. My last two fights have been decisions, and I don't like that. That gave me more anxiety than the fight it was seeing to hear if I won or lost. I'd rather someone just walk up to me immediately after, hey, you lost. I'd be better with that than waiting mm -hmm. 10 minutes to know if I won. <laughs> Yeah, um, sometimes the decisions I, take a little I, too long. Yeah, I don't like that. You know, that's why in boxing I tried my best, uh, you know, amateur boxing wasn't so much trying to land one big knockout shot. It was more multiple shots, let the ref stop it. And usually when I tell people I had more TKOs than I did decisions or anything, it's not a brag thing. It's I just knew how to play it. Uh, you know, amateur boxing is way different. People don't think so, but it's a very much different game. Um, but for me, I get anxious once the fight's done. I don't think about what I have to do in the middle of the fight because I know what I have to do and my coaches would tell me, but when the fight's done and I have to sit, oh, shit, what's the decision? You know, that's that's what drives me nuts. I don't like that. So hopefully Carlos and I either knock each other out or tap <laughs> each other out. That's my prayer. <laughs> so, Do you have a prediction for the fight? I know you're not really one of those type of guys, but I figured I have to ask. No, I, I don't. Um I don't know Carlos like I do the other guys. You know, with Corey, I was able to say either I, – I thought the only way I was going to win is if I knocked him out. And I thought the only way he was going to win is if he subbed me. Uh, you know, and so there's that. My last fight, I, I wasn't sure. I didn't know anything about the guy, so I said I don't know. And in this case, I don't know. Uh, if I had to guess, I think Carlos is going to try and put me out. Um, I think he's going to try and punch me out really easy. Uh, I think he's going to do that. Um but I don't know. He might come out with a blast double and, and start smashing me or, or get me in sick Peruvian necktie or something that came from out of left field. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think it's going to be fun. Uh, I think uh, I think it'd be a very good amateur heavyweight bout. Awesome. I can't wait. September 11th, ladies and gentlemen, you can still get tickets at the Rivers Casino and Resort up in Schenectady, New York. Go to cagewarsmma.com. Purchase the tickets, drive up there, drive down there, drive left, right, wherever you have to go. <laughs> Just drive there and, and watch these fights. They're going to be some awesome fights. Al's going to be fighting as like we just talked about. Yeah. And I'm pumped to see you get in there, Al, and fight. You're always a humble guy and a very respective guy to, to your opponents, and uh, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. Awesome. Same here, man. Thank you. Uh, anything you want to say before the fight comes up or, or any shout-outs? Uh, I'm excited. Uh, you know, for this one, you know, God, God willing, you know, knock on wood uh, that the fights happen and stuff. You know, uh, I'm excited because this is the first time I bet my dad will be at a show. Uh, I'm really excited for that. So I guess I want to say I want to win this for him because he just got uh, in remission for cancer and stuff. And it's the first time he's going to go to a public outing since. So, you know, I'm, I'm really excited uh, to, you know, this one's for him. Awesome. And congratulations to him for his remission. And I yeah, this is definitely, I think, going to be an emotional night, September 11th. 20 yeah. year anniversary. 20 years. Um, it's gonna, definitely going to be a very emotional night. And it's going to be an honor to call these fights alongside Will Barry. Absolutely. So, Al, looking forward to seeing you, seeing you there. Best of luck and uh, you. looking forward to see you fight. Awesome. Can't wait, my man. Thank you. Thank you. This is Carol's Corner MMA Podcast, and we're signing off. See you.